actually just going to basically just do a mini introduction just to get some some basics out of the way um maybe to prep you and then um it's a great book to jot stuff down. I know that if you're a note taker, like every Bible study, you have your um, notes and you follow it and do that stuff. But Proverbs is unique in the fact that it's like one or two word sayings or verses that go through the wisdom of life. And it'd be an excellent book just to start fresh and kind of do your notes. And then I want to, well, my wife, um, she's a doodler. And so... Um, when we first started going here, you know, you know, the gal that shows up with like a bag full of knitting supplies and then you're trying to listen to the sermon and next to you is like this crochet booth, right? It's because she always has to be doing something. In fact, Matt Kessie is exactly like this. If you see Matt Kessie, he's like playing games on his phone and doing stuff. And you're like, dude, you're a pastor. Pay attention to the word. But it's, it actually, for that type of personality, helps them focus on what's being said. All that to say that um, um, if that's you, um, she, she bought like a, a doodle book with color crayons and yeah, see, flash it around to go because she, she was in the know on going through Proverbs. And so if that's beneficial for you or just bring a notepad, I would encourage that. And so um, I'm going to very quickly just go through some highlights on what Proverbs is and then um, we're going to break out and pray and I'll explain that when we get there. So You guys can turn to Proverbs. Actually, I'm going to read. I'm not going to get to it, but I just want to read the first seven verses. And uh, Proverbs 1 says this. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And uh, we'll get into it next week, but does that not describe our world in a nutshell? And I, I, you know, I have a special place in my heart for Proverbs because when I first got saved, it was the first book uh, when I came to Calvary and I didn't grow up in Calvary Chapel that Steve was going through. And so 21-year-old young idiot step into Calvary and he's going through Proverbs. And when it says Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, he's uh, writing to his son. He's about to be in a step into his position. And so it's a father writing to his son who's in a position of authority, who is a believer in Solomon, as you know, or, or probably know, has a special gift of wisdom that was given to him by the power of the Holy Spirit that um, allowed him to have discretion in the area of how life should go. And obviously it's scripture, and so, so there's a whole thing to that. But um, you ever meet, Christians that, and even, you know, even pastors, I'll have people come in and talk to me and usually, you know, it's like a counseling type setting and they'll say, well, so-and-so told me this. And it's like, well, that's wrong, you know? And it's like, we live in a time where believers have absolutely no street smarts and they can know verses and I'm not going to get into it tonight, but there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? Knowledge is knowing stuff. Wisdom is applying that knowledge. And we live in a time where people can know Bible verses, but when you look at their application and it's like, they just kind of blow out and have like a, a, a seizure and freak out. And it's like, how did you get there in the application of a Christian on how, where you're supposed to stand and, and all those things? Here's the other thing. Prophecy update is this Wednesday. Every single time, and I don't know which one that is for me. I've been going here for 20 years. Every single time I go to one of those things, and if I rewind to the first one, the first one blew my mind, right? Because here's uh, the pastor, and we open up our book, and he grabs new news articles, and back in the day, it was, you know, the last six months, and he would um, look at what scripture has to say and then tie it to the current events, right? 
now it's so radical that you could literally, most of the articles, and in, in, um, watch for this Wednesday if you come, most of the articles that he's going to use are probably from that week. That's how fast this stuff is happening. You can literally right now get on your phone and look at what's going on around the world and tie it to a Bible verse. And so if you were here this morning, Pastor Steve's going through the book of Acts. We were in Acts chapter 5. And he um, basically explained what happens to believers in a time of tyranny. And do we live in that time? Absolutely. Uh, Is our state on a fast track to removing our liberties in a place where um, the tyrannical um, dictators are aligning for themselves legally, the positions of power that are going to put Christians into a box? Absolutely. I can't believe, if you, if you follow these things, and there's a, a few things that I keep a pretty good pace on, one of them is re- religious liberties, one of them is uh, Second Amendment stuff, and the left always has a, an agenda that they're ready for in January that they want to get done for the year. And so there are bills going on right now, and you might have seen these on Facebook and other places, but the sheriffs posted one that talk about um, a bill that is designed to remove the authority of an elective sheriff. And in a nutshell, it goes like this. Sheriffs are elected. And so when you have a conservative county like we do, Benton County, um, they are a um, roadblock to um, a state gone rogue in the sense of they will stand in the area of constitutional liberties and say, we're not enforcing that. It's against the Constitution. We're not doing it. And so this bill, um, basically, instead of, and by the way, the sheriff is an elected position. It is voted in by the people. And so now um, we have a bill, and it's Washington. So is it going to pass? It's like probably, you know, I'm not trying to be prophetic, but it's just the reality. And the bill, in a nutshell, replaces the elected part um, by the people to a panel of um, guys or a process that they have to go through what they call a background check. And they list the CJTC, which is uh, Criminal Justice Commission. But anyway, it puts in vague terms how they have to pass a background and go through procedures to be approved in order to become elected. And when you look at the rules and the vagueness, it allows them to pick who they want. And if you're not woke and on their agenda, then you are disapproved because of whatever rules, Pastor Steve was talking about this this morning, agency rules, agency law, um, that they've made up. Now, that is not a coincidence, you know? The writing is on the wall, and unless you have your head buried in the sand and you're not reading your Bible, um, we know what's coming. It's not a surprise, right? And so all that to say that we live in a time that requires Christians to have wisdom on all kinds of levels. Where do you stand? How do you stand? Whether it's uh, the COVID lockdowns and there was a lot of confusion, and you know what? The church failed collectively as a whole. When you look at the amount of churches that folded their cards, disobeyed scripture, put fellowship on YouTube, what's well, like, does Satan want us to do Hebrews 10, 25? Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, even more so as you see the day approaching. And churches just folded up that verse, tossed, tossed it in the garbage and says, oh, well, we, we are nice. Are you nicer than God? And it's like, um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm rabbit trailing. I do want to um, give you a few things, though. The book of Proverbs um, is basically a collection uh, of writings, okay? And it's broken down like this. And it's, uh, this is how I have it categorized. It can be a couple nuanced things, but um, seven collections. And so it starts in verse uh, 1 of chapter 1 and goes from there. And the first one is like a prologue. And you have it basically verse one being the main title, 
verses two through seven is a preamble, and then uh, verses eight through chapter eight, uh, verse 36 of chapter eight is, a, is the prologue, and then the epilogue is in chapter nine. We'll, we'll go through that um, step by step. Um, second collection would be um, the Proverbs of Solomon, and it starts in um, chapter 10, verse one, and goes to 22, 16. And the first one is Solomon as well, but you see two different breaks. Um, we just read one of them, and then the Proverbs of Solomon being the second one. The third one is uh, 30 sayings of the wise, and we get these, you know, I'll go through them when we get there, but these are the descriptions that title the section of Proverbs. Um, number four is more sayings of the wise, and so there's no author tied to those groups of sayings. That's how it is categorized. Uh, fifth collection is Hezekiah, and it's basically uh, Hezekiah's men that group together um, a collection of Solomon's sayings, and that starts in chapter 25. And then the sixth one is the words of Agur, and we'll get to that uh, person when we get to it, and that starts in chapter 30. And there's an oracle, which is verses 1 through 14, and then what they call numerical sayings that uh, is the second half of that chapter. And then the last one is the words of King uh, Lemuel, and really the, f the first section, verses 1 through 9, is a mother writing to her son. This is where you get the idea of a Proverbs 31 woman. Uh, and then the second half of that is a mother writing to her son on how to choose a wife or what a biblical God-fearing wife is supposed to look like. And that is great for the son side. It's also the um, highlighted definition of what a Christian woman is supposed to be. And uh, that's in verses 10 through 31. And so that's kind of a nutshell on how it's broken down. Um, it names um, five authors, and I alluded to those already. Collection one and two were Solomon. Um, collection three was the men of Hezekiah. Four is Agur, and uh, five is Lemuel. And so uh, those are the authors that are listed. And then there's literary forms. And in order to understand what a proverb is, you have to understand a little bit about literature, right? Words mean things. And so this is poetry. And what's weird and where the disconnect comes from between a Hebrew and us as an American is that when we think of poetry, we think of like uh, rhymes, um, you know, just, I don't have to explain it, like the, liter uh, the poetry form uh, of an American is not the same as a Hebrew. And so the Hebrew form of poetry is... Um, well, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go through some linguist, linguistic terms, but um, it's basically um, a saying and then it stops and the poetry is in a, the collection as a whole. I know that sounds confusing. If you've never read Proverbs, you'll understand as we go through it, but here's some technical terms right, that I find beneficial. Um, terseness. And, if I'm butchering these words, um, I'm sorry, okay? I went to MMI, so if you're college educated, then good for you, yay for that. Um, but a terseness is, it's, here's the definition. Use of a few words to say something, sometimes in a way that seems rude or unfriendly. Now, one of my favorite things about this book is I had this false notion of what a believer was before I was a Christian, and I got that from my own opinion, from the world or from watching TV, and they always portrayed the Christian as this weak Marvin Milk Toast, usually the weird dude, right? On every sitcom or every movie, it's the weird, crazy cult dude that's the Christian. And when I got to Proverbs and it would say things just completely truthful, bold, didn't beat around the bush, just spoke directly to the heart of, to me as a man, but obviously as a woman as well, um, I was flabbergasted because they actually spoke the way I could receive it. 
It wasn't churchy. It wasn't religion. It wasn't, you know, the let's hold hands and sing kumbaya. It was real. And I was blown away that scripture did that. I'm going to give you a couple examples tonight, but um, there you have that. They have uh, uh, aphorisms. That is a pithy observation that contains a general truth. And here's an example of an, of an aphorism. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And some, something you have to know with Proverbs is that it'll use an aphorism, but it expects you as the reader to know the truth in Scripture as a whole to be able to understand what that means. Because what you can do is you can take a saying completely out of context and is absolutely not what it's saying. You have to know the context of Scripture as a whole to unpack that revelation of wisdom, right? And so there are things like this. This is one of the ones I have memorized. Um, Don't answer a fool according to his folly, uh, lest you become one, okay? And that's the idea of you don't cast your pearls before swine, and if somebody doesn't want to hear it, they don't get to, And it is foolish to argue with a fool because they don't care. It's like beating your head up against a brick wall spiritually. And so in that context, you don't answer or get involved into a conversation with a fool. It's not worth it. Okay, this is what the verse right after that says. Answer a fool uh, according to his folly, lest he become wise in his own eyes. And it's like, wait a minute, that's a contradictory statement. First it says, don't answer a fool, don't get involved in the conversation. And then the next one after it, it says, answer a fool, uh, lest he he thinks that he's smart. And it's like, how, how does that work? Well, it depends on the situation that you're in. And if you have a fool who thinks that he's smart, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can see that there's an inroad there. And guess what? Guess who that was uh, when they were 21 years old? A person who thought he was super smart, that had it all figured out. And the Christians were a bunch of dum-dums, right? That was me. Until someone answered me and go, yeah, you're not that smart. What do you do with this? Uh, it's like, ah, 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 does not compute. Like, I, I've never been challenged in that way. And in that context, the answering of a fool produced the fruit of wisdom. And so the uh, truth of those verses is predicated on the situation that you're in through the power of the Holy Spirit based off of the truth of scripture as a whole. And you have to put that together in order to extrapolate that wisdom of Solomon, which is obviously through the Lord or of the Lord. And so uh, aphorism, it requires an expected knowledge of truth as a whole for context, okay? And then you have uh, figurative language. Now this has been butchered in our day because you have this movement in Christian circles to go off on allegory. Some of this is theological because they have come up with stuff as far as eschatology goes, as far as pneumatology goes. And if, let me dumb that down for you. Eschatology, uh, ology is just the study of, right? So theology, theo is God, ology is the study of. It's the study of God. And so all those are as fancy technical terms that theologians use to put together um, scripture, in context that we can organize it, right? And so pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit, pneuma being spirit. Eschatology, eska, uh, it's the study of end times, right? And so for certain advantageous theological positions, it is absolutely beneficial to allegorize. So if you are all millennial and you don't believe that there's a literal millennium, then what do you have to do with those eschatological scriptures. And you got to make them go away, right? So how do you do that? Well, you just allegorize it. Oh, well, that doesn't really mean that. What that means is, and they come up with whatever their interpretation is. Now, Winery's um, point to to that is, now I got to have you around every time I read my Bible, because I don't know what it means. And what you've done is allegorized a scripture that um, makes that unscriptural because words mean things. And so there are certain, certainly allegories in, the, in Scripture, right? But there are other things, and that if you have taken a fifth-grade English class, 
you understand this, right? We talk to each other in the context of language to be able to understand each other, and no one goes around arguing, oh, well, that's your definition, and well, that doesn't really mean this, that means this. Like, we, we wouldn't be able to go to the gas station if we didn't understand some form of natural communication, right? And don't, don't get bought off or um, confused or overwhelmed when the PhDs make this seem totally foggy because it's not, all right? We've been talking and communicating for since uh, the beginning with no issues, and it's the same in Scripture. There are things you have to work with or, or go through and figure out, and um, that requires study, that, that requires di- diving into Scripture. But for the most part, words mean things, and you just have to figure out what the uh, language uh, is saying, what the definition is, and go from there. And it's not, it's not a hard thing. And so to give you just a very quick, simple list, a simile, right? What is that? It's an explicit comparison between two unlike things that have something in common. And I'll give you uh, an example of a simile in Proverbs. In Proverbs 26, 18 and 19, it says this. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking. That's a simile. And what I love about that is it compares somebody who is a manipulator, somebody who's out to deceive a person, and then when he gets caught or, you know, um, it's starting to unravel, he's like, ah, I'm just kidding, man, I'm only joking. You know those types of personalities that are completely annoying? The um, politician types, right? It, It compares that to... Um, a madman, a deceiver, um, who throws firebrands, arrows, and leads to death. We don't talk like that anymore. And Proverbs doesn't mess around. And so there's an example of a simile. I love it. Um, Metaphor, a figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action to which it is not literally applicable. Um, I have an example of this in Proverbs 11.22 of a metaphor. As a ring, and this is what Proverbs 11.22 says, as a ring of gold and a swine's snout, so get that picture, a pig with a, a nose ring, a shiny gold nose ring, and this is the second part to the same verse, so is a lovely woman who lacks discretion. That's hilarious, right? Like, if you were to say that today, it's like, do you know how many trolls would come out? Like, you, you would get banned from YouTube. In fact, you know, this is probably won't even make it up on our page. It's comparing the woman who has no discretion to that of a, of a pig that looks nice because it has a gold ring. Like, how ridiculous is that? And that's a metaphor, A couple more, and then I'll move on. Allegory, uh, I talked a little bit about that already. Um, Have you ever read or um, seen, they actually have um, a version on, is it um, Amazon Prime that we watched this? They did an enactment of Pilgrim's Progress uh, through a video that was pretty cool. A little scary if your kid's really little, but in any case... Okay, Answers in Genesis, Media Now, Right Now Media. If you have those, if not, then um, you don't. It's not going to help. But that's an allegory of the spiritual journey, right? That's a book that allegorizes, and um, one of those can be, although not as good as Pilgrim's Progress. Um, I was going to say Lord of the Rings, but an actual really good one is um, his friend C.S. Lewis, uh, the Narnia series. Right, that's a that's a Christian allegory, where Aslan is a picture of Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And if you've seen those movies, like that's a great example uh, of an allegory. Hyperbole, and that uh, that's an exaggerated statement or claim not meant to be taken literally. And here's an example of that. Proverbs twenty six fifteen says this: The lazy man buries his hand in the bowl. I had God speak this verse to me at one point in life. 
The lazy man buries his hand in the bowl and it wearies him to bring it back to his mouth. I have a uh, different translation. This is the NIV. The sluggard buries his hand in the, in, in the dish. He is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. And that's the idea of someone who's so stinking lazy. And that, does that define our culture? Absolutely, 100% defines our culture. Uh, but somebody who's so lazy, they put their, their hand to the spoon, go to uh, grab a piece of food or in their dish, and they're so lazy, they just stop there. They're just like, oh, I can't do it. And you're so lazy, you can't even feed yourself. That's a great hyperbole. Irony, saying one thing but intending the opposite. I think you guys know what, what that is. Um, there's a lot of parallelism in Hebrew writing. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to do tonight before we break out in prayer um, is just talk about some of the subjects that are covered in Proverbs that absolutely um, changed my life. And I know scripture, it's like, okay, you, got, you get saved, God starts tearing your life apart and it changes you. Yeah, but this is, it's so pointed, right? It, 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 like, it reveals the day-to-day -day activity on how a man and woman should think, act, and operate as a Christian. And a lot of times people will take the grace and the salvation verses and uh, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. They forget the second part to those who live or who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. There are so many things of how we operate in the world that require, in fact, uh, I, I mentioned one um, when, when we walked th through the vid. That required a breakdown of wisdom that wasn't, um, specifically in scripture, it had to be flushed out, right? There was no verse that said, thou shalt not COVID. And I'm not trying to put that in a box of defining what is spiritual in that, but you, you get my point, right? You had to walk through that through wisdom of what the Lord had you doing and where to stand. And Proverbs, those street smarts, when, if you don't have that, you're just wandering around dumb, blind, and lie. It's like the book of Judges. Everyone's just doing what they think is right in their own eyes. And as believers, there's the reason, one of the reasons God put this book here is that we don't have to live life that way, right? And part of having a victorious, spirit-filled life is that when we're presented with something, we don't just go, duh, right? Right? There's wisdom that the Holy Spirit wants to use to navigate those decisions. And so here's some subjects. Wisdom, right? I already gave a definition of that. Um, you have a verse that we already read, the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. Okay, we'll get into that next week. Then it goes on to take it a step further and says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Now, knowledge is just information, right? In fact, Think about this. Who wrote this book? It was Solomon. Did Solomon have um, amazing life wisdom? He had some issues, right? When it comes to women, and, and that's on one of my slides. Um, one of the secretaries put that up there because that's how I have it memorized is in the book of Proverbs is wisdom, wine, and women. And you look at Solomon's life, and it's like, how could you have the gift of wisdom and live a life that is so foolish? Well, because you can have knowledge and you can know your Bible verses. And that's a thing. We're supposed to know scripture. Um, Psalm 119, there's this whole thing with hiding the word in our hearts, writing it on the tablet of our hearts that we might not sin against you. When you go through day-to-day -day things, and they happen and things come up, I have scriptures that, that pop up into my mind. Oh, that's this first, plug it in here. That's this first, plug it in here. If you don't know the scriptures, it's hard to do that apart from the spirit, you know, just kind of digging you out of a hole. But when you know the scriptures, you can apply accordingly. But if you have no knowledge, you have no ability to do that. Okay, so that's knowledge. But wisdom is the application of that knowledge. So, you can know the verse, 
but how does that verse apply and, and when should I use it and all those things? Um, again, do we need wisdom in 2024? It's, it's getting dark, right? And as things heat, as things heat up, Satan likes to confuse us. In fact, um, one of those that just popped into my mind was John the Baptist. Jesus said that there is no greater, up to that point, there is no greater man than John the Baptist, is, this, is, is what he said about John. Um, and here's the reality. John was a, had the ministry of repentance, right? He was to pave the way of the Messiah through the ministry of repentance, and we know, if you've read that story, what that looked like and that John was somebody who was a rowdy dude. He was a Proverbs dude, walking out in the wilderness, preaching the gospel, street smart, eating locusts and uh, honey, wearing a belt made out of, you know, a suit made out of camel's hair, right? That's a rowdy dude. That's, that's a Jesus hippie, right? And yet, there reached a point through the fire where he's in jail, and he sends word, is he the Messiah, or should I look for another? And it is really hard to, when you're in the fire, to stand in those places. And Proverbs is something that you can hide home deep, and when those things come up, it is absolutely fruitful to bank on, hey, did I really make the right decision? Should I have really said that? Is it really um, gonna work out? Um, and those types of things. Um, okay, I talked about that, I talked about that. Um, here's the second one, or another subject. Fools and simpletons. Um, Proverbs 12.1 says this. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Uh, I love that verse. We have, uh, in fact, um, you know when your kids are really small and they're starting to say, you know, bad words and you're trying to guide them in wholesome speech. And one of those is, you know, one of your little kids will call the other sibling, hey, you're stupid. Shut up, stupid. And... um when that first happened, um, I remember my wife going, you don't say that. And it was like a bad word. Right. And, uh, she's absolutely right. Because in the context, right there, it's like calling your brother Raka, like in a the heart, they're like, you are a stupid, foolish person. Right. And so as parents, we don't allow that. But in the context, it's like, well, you know, Hey, stupid. Hey, that's a bad word. We don't say that in the Lewis house. Well, Depends on the context, because it's scripture. And we live in a time where nobody loves instruction. Nobody wants a rebuke. And as believers, it is something not only that we should expect, but we should desire, because it's something that the Lord's gonna do to correct us. It's something that people who actually love us are going to do because they wanna pour truth out into our lives because they love us. And if you hate that, the Bible says that you are stupid. And it's not just a derogatory name calling type of thing. It means to be a simpleton, to, to be a dullard. And um, I have a few definitions of that. Um, simple, simpleton. Kind of a person who is easily led, gullible, silly, um, Mentally naive and lazy, morally, willfully irresponsible, senseless. Um, I'm going to be stepping into the young adults, which is the college age group that Zach Lamberson was doing. I'm going to be taking that over here in, in March. And one of the things that I've been seeing coming into this and the Lord been preparing me and just wisdom walking into that is we live in a culture of weak simpleton men who are gullible, who are easily led astray. And this is a spiritual thing that is destroying people. Um, 
the dude who's living at home in his mom's basement playing video games. And it's like, we laugh at that, it's tongue in cheek, whatever. That describes a whole section of our culture and it's wrecking dudes because of the, uh, of the crazy time that we lived in and, and live in and social media. We live in a time where guys have no social skills. In law enforcement, we call it IPC, interpersonal communication. How do you talk to somebody? And we have dudes that have never been in a position where they understand social cues. They, don't, they can't read body language. They're uh, nervous to talk to uh, members of the opposite sex. And even though they um, are believers and they have good intentions, because they don't have that uh, wisdom, they look like stalkers, right? They look like weirdos because they don't have the um, Christian, spirit-filled, wise upbringing that men are supposed to be trained up in, right? That's an that's a in, indictment on fathers. Fathers, bring your children up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And it is something that is wrecking dudes. It is an issue, right? And um, irresponsible. You know, I have... Um, I have entrepreneurs on both sides of my family. And what they say across the board, in fact, a lot of them, especially who are getting um, older, they're, they're selling their business and retiring. And maybe they would have gone another five years or, or however longer. Now they're like, forget it, I'm done. And you wanna know one of the biggest, if not the biggest reasons for that is? Employees, simpletons. They cannot get people who actually come to work because they're lazy. They can't get people to not flake out. And if they're not going to show up, go, hey, uh, I'm not going to make it. They just don't show up. Um, my mom had an employee who called in sick and she said, oh, uh, or no, they called, said, I'm not going to make it today. Oh, are you sick? No. Okay. Uh, family emergency? No. Okay. Well, what's going on? Yeah, I just don't want to come to work today. And she's like, okay, but that can't, that's not how it works, right? Like, I don't want to come to work today. But if you don't come to work, I don't have anyone that fills that position. Now I got to do your job and my company is going to fold if that's how we work. And you know what their response is with the simpleton culture that we live in? Oh, that's fine. I quit. And that is, I mean, it, it's kind of mind boggling to me because um, I just didn't grow up in a time where that was acceptable. And if you didn't show up on time, and if you didn't come to an interview in a suit, and if you didn't have some type of manners, uh, morality, respect, etiquette, responsibility, then you weren't getting the job. When I, when I went to high school, they pushed, you got to go to college, you got to go to college, because if you didn't have a resume that actually stood out, dude, you weren't going to get a job. That has since gone by the wayside, and actually it's flipped on its head. And now you have employers that when you look at, the, they look at the college degree, it's irrelevant because the jokers that come out of the college institutions are so simple um, that it, they're, they're actually, it takes more work to train because they have to reverse all the stuff that these people who are wise in their own eyes think they know to actually train them to get to do the job. Whereas if you're somebody, and here's a pro tip for all you young people, if you're somebody, and this is what a believer should be anyway, but if you don't know, if you're somebody who shows up on time, like you're supposed to be at work at 9 a.m. and you're there at 9 a.m. If you're somebody who when you are at work, you actually work, right? And um, listen, I get it. I worked out, I worked for the government. I worked out at Hanford where it, they make it almost impossible for you to do that, right? And so there is some nuance there but the heart of the matter and the philosophy is still the same. If you are supposed to be, if you're on the clock and you are supposed to be working, that means you're not supposed to be playing Tetris, right? Probably. And if you are somebody who doesn't do that and you get paid for eight hours and you put eight hours of work, you are gold. You will rise up to the top of that institution career or whatever, because nobody else is doing that. You will become the manager. You will rise to the top. I guarantee it. If you're somebody who, whatever your craft is, 
right? Electrician, teaching, law enforcement, whatever your craft is, if you're somebody that actually takes um, pride and actually learns the job, dude, you're going to the top just by virtue of what the Christian life is supposed to be. Simpleton, okay, fool. One who is dull and obstinate in himself, his, his opinion is his God. This is just kind of how I wrote it out. In society, so in himself, uh, wise in his own eyes, right? I have an opinion and that's what I'm gonna go with and who are you to tell me otherwise? And I'm gonna run my life by the way that seems right to me. And I can't even, I can't even say that statement without the verse pop of Proverbs popping into my head, right? And it goes like this. There's a way that seems right to a man. And what's the second part to that? And its end is the way of death, right? And a fool is the opposite. There's a way that seems right to a man and its end is a way of life. And I will live my life how I see fit. So that's in himself. In society, a menace. At best, he wastes your time. And at worst, he brings ruin. And the Bible um, highlights the fool and the simpleton over and over and over. Here's another one. A scoffer or a scorner or a mocker that shows up about 17 times in the book of Proverbs. He is grouped with the foolish, but proves that attitude over aptitude classifies him as such. So he's in the category of a fool, but by his attitude uh, of being a mocker or a scoffer or somebody who's scornful, he positions himself and lines it up because of his mindset in the category of a fool. That makes sense. Um, sluggard. I already kind of nailed that home, but um, uh, I've already said that. I've already said that. I'll add this. Somebody, so the dude or woman who won't start things, who won't finish things, who won't face things, and who's utterly useless to the people around him. That's a good definition of a sluggard. Uh, Proverbs talks about um, what I labeled as thy true friend. Uh, What is a biblical friend to a believer? And, you know, by experience, and this is going to be my fifth year here uh, on staff, and one of the things that I've noticed is that you will have people, and I am classifying these people as Christians, and I really believe that they're believers, But they will um, get told, the Lord will reveal to them, they'll come in for counseling. They will get shown a wisdom, an insight of the Lord, and they don't like it. And it's fascinating to me how many times I'll notice somebody just hasn't been around. I'm like, hey, what happened to so-and-so? Oh, they moved churches. Oh, okay. And I don't care about that. It's not Calvary Chapel right? It's the body of Christ. I, I could give a rip what church you go to as long as it preaches the word. But then um, you find out, it's like, oh yeah, they went in and talked to so-and-so and uh, they don't like this church anymore. And it's like, here's, here's the reality of where you have to be at as a believer. You have to let our, your brothers and sisters tell you things that are hard. And there's a balance to that. I'm not talking about somebody who is belligerent or, you know, you, you know the difference. You know somebody that loves you and is like, hey, dude, love you, but you're over here. No, you're a dumb dumb. And I specifically have those people in my life who are true friends who, if I need to know something, I go to them and it's not expecting something of agreement. And if you are that person, You have to flip that around or you don't have true friends because every person can find someone to agree with them, to justify their lifestyle, to justify their choice. Hey, I'm thinking about this. They go to a Christian. uh, This is what the word says. Nah. And then they go to somebody who they know are going to say, oh, that's fine. I'm that, you know what, that person, no, you you need to love yourself and you need to do what's best for you. Da, 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 da. And, and they're just like, oh yeah, amazing. You're, so, you're such a good friend. No, they're not. 
Not in the definition of what the Bible would classify as thy true friend. Um, what is a good neighbor is uh, another category of that. Speech. Already went through a bunch of this, um, but practical application of speech would be this. How to use our tongues to godliness. When the Bible says speak truth in love, that, is, that has to be implemented through wisdom. Okay? So um, this is the one that always sticks into my head, and it's, it's highly risky, but I'm expecting for you that uh, you apply love believes all things. Okay? So it goes like this. What I mean is I want you to give me the benefit of the doubt that I don't have a nasty heart. I'm just using this as an example to flush out the power of the tongue and the wisdom that has to be used in order to stand in godliness through our words. And it goes like this. Um, Your wife, guys, comes up to you and goes, "Uh, does this dress make me look fat? And here's the reality. Um, The Bible says, speak truth. How does that go, right? And if you love your wife, then you want to prove to her that she's beautiful on the inside, no matter what, that it doesn't matter what uh, she looks like on the outside, that it, it doesn't matter what she's wearing, she's beautiful, and all of those things should be true in your heart. In one of the sections that I quoted, Proverbs 31 woman, it says that she should, um, um, and I'm gonna paraphrase, um, in doing uh, something like chores around the house or something like that, uh, strengthen her arms. And there is a truth and a reality that in America, if you are one of these people that eats McDonald's every day, right, and you're a thousand pounds, it's going to affect your life. Health, uh, the ability to do ministry, the ability to get around, There's going to be an impact on you. Obesity is a major problem in our country. And if you love somebody, you should be speaking truth to those things in their life. Now, what's the second part to that context? In love. So as a Christian, do we speak truth to someone? And uh, in that context, let's say they are married to uh, somebody who's a thousand pounds and I'm trying to be so extreme that um, it's non-existent, just for sake of argument. Um, you have to apply that in a way that speaks truth, but also lets them know how, that you love them, right? Insert wisdom. And so um, when my wife will come to me in those things, um, she'll go like, hey, what does this shirt look like? And um, she, you know, I'm, I'm very, uh, I wear it on my face. And um, I'll be like, oh, it looks nice. Uh, you don't like it, huh? Looks nice. And then she'll, you know, come up with another thing, and I'm like, I love that, right? And I can, with my words and with my speech, edify and speak truth at the same time in a way that lifts people up. And this goes um, both ways, wisdom to discern our words. Um, there is a, you know, in... In my background, uh, one of the way that I insert this in uh, teacher, teaching kids. Can you teach a five-year-old the same way as a college person? No. And if you do, you're wrong. Like you're missing a whole um, ability for them to understand and be able to communicate with them, right? So you have to tailor your words accordingly, whether you're a lawyer in the court of law. And for, for my background, we could come on to a situation and through speech, I can ramp that up, right? And let's just say there's a use of force in front of me. I can make that person, uh, that's not true. You can't make somebody do anything per se because we all have a free will. But I can enter that situation and push buttons that basically drives it to a fight, right? Or I can de-escalate. And through the power of my speech and the words that I use, try to, diffuse the situation. And again, insert free will. So the Bible says, live at peace with all men as much as relies on you. But the power of my words and my tongue can change how all those directions go if I am in tune and have the wisdom for that application. Boy, is that insightful in the life of a believer. 
in how you talk to your spouse, in how you treat your boss, in the way that you operate in the community of fools, right? And man, there's tons of application in Proverbs that speak to that. Power of words, the weakness of words, when something should be said and we're dancing around the fact because we don't want to say it and at the same time it's going to destroy somebody. It's like, dude, you got you to tell them or you don't love them. The family unit it, uh, has a lot of verses about husbands and wives. It has a lot of verses about parenting. Some of those are highly controversial in our culture today, but I would submit to you that the parenting and the kid thing is not getting better, it's getting worse. Maybe, right? Just maybe we should take a look at what God has to say in the book of Proverbs. Uh, life, social, material, personal, psychological, moral, spiritual, all kinds of different verses that point to the category of the life. And actually, it's not just our life here and now, but it's like the life of a believer, right? And then it speaks of death. In fact, it mentions death or uh, dying between 20 and 30 times in the book of Proverbs. Um, that's good. Um, we, what time do I normally end this? 7.30, that's what I thought. Okay. So we have um, about 17, 18 minutes, and this is what I want to do. Um, this is my first... Sunday night study in 2024. It looks to me like it's going to be an interesting year in our culture, with the election, with the economy, um, spiritually, um, whatever Steve talks about, like I already mentioned in the prophecy update. Um, and then we all have things that are going on in our lives, right? At, at work, health, in our family, or whatever. And I just want to start Proverbs, the first of the year, breaking out groups of like five and just praying for each other. Now, as soon as someone says that, and I'm going back to how I'm built, if you're an extrovert, just plug your ears for 30 seconds. This doesn't apply to you, and you're all happy, and you're going to pray for each other. Ah, yeah, and okay, awesome. But for a person like me, where as soon as you're like, hey, get together and uh, pray for the person you don't know, it's like, ah, oh. right? Dude, ma'am, I get it, right? But here's the thing. The Bible says that you don't have because you don't ask. The Bible says that we are supposed to communicate with the Lord, and the, the theological term for that is prayer. The Bible says that um, in the church, if you take the elders and lay hands on the sick, that God, um, that, is that, that portion of prayer, God uh, appoints healings to that designation. It says that we are supposed to pray for supplications, which is personal requests. And as a body, as a whole, as a fellowship, we need to come together and be praying for one another. Now, that's an individual supplications. Um, we're about in a couple months to open up a brand new building. Um, I'm not trying to be prophetic, but I kind of think that it's gonna blow up. And I know we've been growing on every level, but more room, new coffee shop, new fellowship hall, like, we're living in a state that's going rogue, a world that's going dark, and we're like in this beacon of spiritual freedom and liberty where the gospel's being preached. I don't know, third service this morning, 16 people got saved. And uh, I, told, uh, I told boss when he's walking in his office, I'm like, hey, that Bible study was all right, but 16 people? Man! And uh, part of the theme was, you know, it's not the teacher. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. And my point was, you know, it's like, okay, that was, that was a good Bible study. It was okay. But, you know, this is like the book of Acts stuff. 16 people. When I got saved, the church that I grew up in, that never happened. And here it's just kind of the norm because you have a dude that's faithful to allow the opportunity for people to be presented with the gospel. And so, School's blowing up. We got more portables coming. And you know what? If we had the ability to build a high school, we could have the biggest high school in the Tri-Cities right now. I have no doubt. So your personal life, 2024, what God's doing in our fellowship, there are many things to pray for. Amen? So take the next 15 minutes. 
um, just for the people around you, gather together, you know, five, uh, it, make it smaller. Just get to know the person. Uh, one thing about Sunday nights is I, I want it to be a little bit of a home fellowship where we actually know some of the people that go to our church and don't meet someone. How long have you been on Calvary? 30 years. Oh, nice to meet you. I'm Matt, right? And um, so just take that moment, pray for them, whatever you need, and um, we'll end it there. Um, I'll let you leave when you want to leave. Um, I did this last time and everyone kept praying and I had to kick you out of here. And so try to do 15 minutes. Okay. But you have freedom in the Lord to stay here all night because, uh, Michael and Keyshawn said that they would stay here all night. That's a lie.